They're coming to get you, Barbara. Buried deep in the Pacific Northwest, one team in Springfield, Oregon, takes on the impossible, finding dead Mopar muscle and bringing it back from the grave. Award-winning master of Mopar, Mark Warman, his cousin Doug, his daughter Alyssa, his best friend Royal, his painter Will, his assembly tech Justin, and the rest of the GYC ghouls are restoring, resurrecting, and recreating some of the fastest fiercest and rarest muscle cars on the planet. This is Graveyard Cars. Motor Trend's Car of the Year is back and all new for 1970. From the new sporty vertical grille and headlight bezels to the sleek horizontal tail lights, Plymouth is ready to shake things up for the competition. The standard engine for the Roadrunner is still the 383 four barrel. For a little extra money, you can get the 440 Super Commando or the 440 six barrel. And if you got the guts, you can opt for the legendary 426 Hemi. There will be no mistaking this car on the road. With bold new graphics and a new bumper treatment, front and rear, this car screams business. Available in all of the new high impact colors for 1970 and available with optional 727 torque flight automatic transmission or a heavy duty manual transmission with all new pistol grip shifter. You can let your groovy style show. The new rally wheels and polyglass wide tread performance tires will intimidate the competition and let everyone know it means business. Engine call out and turn signal indicators are just part of the driver experience to remind you that you are in control. When it's time to shut down the pack, flip a switch on the dash, open the cold air induction hood and hold on because this baby really comes alive. New styling, bold new stance and graphics tells everyone that Plymouth makes it for 1970. One of the cars I'm really excited about coming through the shop, finally into assembly now, is our 70 Roadrunner 383 four-speed convertible. So this is a really rare car. And when we got it, it was in tire straights. And I know we've touched on it in the past. In fact, I think I used it as a tutorial once to show how the inner rocker is a piece of quarter inch angle iron steel on the convertible car. So you see right here, it goes all the way out to here and then it spot welds down inside here. You won't see that in a hard top car. It's one of 179 built with a 383 and a four speed. It's tour red, black interior. The guy took some Tony D'Agostino Liberties and dressed it up with some uh, wheel opening moldings, which it didn't have from the factory, rocker moldings, did a six way seat, some things like that in it. But at the end of the day, it is a really, really neat, rare car that I'm excited to finally see here in the assembly shop. So the car came over from paint and it was pretty much all done from a body standpoint. It just needs the assembly. One of the first things Justin did is the second skin sound deadener all over the interior, on the interior quarters, on the insides of the doors, everything that it takes to make these cars quiet and solid. He needed to get that in. After that, he could put that carpet set up in it. Again, this is one of those nice ones that don't come in a box all folded up. It's just a big, beautiful set of carpets that go in, very little steaming. That's what's going on now. The air grabber is standard with a Hemi and optional with a 440. Vacuum operated, the air grabber sends cooler, denser air into the carbs, and cooler air gives you a more powerful charge. These decals are a little tricky to put on there, but once they're on there, this is one of the coolest features you could get on a B-body in 1970. I just love the way it looks. You know, when it's open, it just looks like a shark's mouth. It's just a super cool feature of that car.
big bolts in from behind yeah. into this? Okay. Should be. And it's through the trunk or underneath? Underneath. Underneath, okay. All right, let's do that. One of the things I'm trying to do a little bit more this season is be involved in the assembly of the cars as they go through the shop. At least certain aspects of it that I think are interesting and something that the audience can learn from. Maybe they're putting one of these cars together. In the case of the 70 Roadrunner, it's time to build out the back end of the car, the taillights, bumper, things like that. I want to work with Justin on it so that I can share with our audience at home some of the things in the way of fasteners and gaskets and seals and even final fitment that are very important if you haven't put one of these together. You already pre-fit this? Yeah. Okay, great. A little low on this side. Yeah, I think your side needs to go up a little bit. All right. Sure you pre-fit this thing? Yeah. I told you we had to do some adjusting. Oh. There we go. Those brackets on the bottom kind of stop it from going up. These are new replica brackets. But this one here is bent a little bit this way. But because of that, it's hitting right here. If you look where the paint's missing on it, when I shoved it up against the car with so much brute force, like a jack, it knocked the paint off of it. So we've got to take this and we've got to roll it down. All right, let's try it again. It's always nice for Mark to make some time out of his day to come out here and help me. This bumper is already pre-fit, but it just needs a little bit more tweaking. So our 1971 Roadrunner, 446 barrel, four speed. This is a really unique car. It's a one of 137 built. It's tore red. It actually has over the roof stripes to it. It's also coated for the ones that go out over the fenders. This owner doesn't actually want those put back on the car because he has a race car version of it at home that he wants this one to emulate. And by the way, this guy has actual videotape of this car racing down the quarter mile from the 70s. I just love that kind of stuff. You can't fake that. There's no filters that you could put on that video that would really make it look authentic like those. So when you're watching those, you're actually watching that car racing 30 plus years ago. I mean, it's a time capsule. Once we got going on that car, we got it dipped, did all the metal work on it, immediately sent it over to Will's department. That's when he could take over and do all of the body and paint work and get us to where we are today. So after we laid the DP90 out on the jams, we went ahead and went on top of it with the single stage. All of the jam work on that color I do in single stage, it's a fine metallic, lays out great, no big deal. When it comes to the body of the car, we do it in the base coat, clear coat version of the EV2 Tour Red. That's our own formula that matches perfect. And because it's such a big car, you can't put all the parts and pieces in there at the same time. So I panel paint it. If you do seven coats on the car, you gotta do seven coats on the parts. Just stay consistent with it and you can get away with it. So now I know we get a little bit of pushback on this because we've talked about painting a car when it's metallic all at the same time. The hood, the fenders, the deck lid, everything should be on the car because it's metallic and it's hard to match. And that is, by and large, that's 90% true all the time. In the case of Tor Red, Will's painted 30 of them since he's been back here in five years. And he has the formula, he creates the formula himself in base coat. So he knows all of the aspects of the color. He knows how many coats. He knows what direction to hold his gun continually to make sure that it doesn't have a side tone or color flop to it. So when he comes to me and says, listen, I'd like to paint this car separate in pieces because of the enormous size of the car and all the pieces and parts, I got no problem signing off on that. I trust Will in that area. I love panel painting cars. Take your time, your air pressure, keep it the same. Three coats of clear, and that last coat of clear that I put on, I kind of hammer it on because the panel's flat. So it looks like it's been cut and buffed and it hasn't yet, which makes Noah's job even easier. So once all the panels are wrapped up, I'm able to start on the body of the car. I started by spraying all the jam areas underneath the hood, inside the fender, stuff like that to get it wrapped up. So once all that's done, we're ready to get the final paint going. On this particular car, Mark had the drivetrain ready to go, so he was kind of pushing us to hurry up and get it done.
Got the final paint done. Car looks amazing. Kick it over to Mark, get that drivetrain installed, which is super nice, because at that point, he kicks it right back to me to go ahead and get it striped. Dodge and Plymouth B bodies like to use in quarter extensions. That's what this is. This little quarter extension here will come over here and it'll go into these little holes. I think it has to go under the bumper because of Einstein here. But you want to take that bumper off there, Cool Breeze? No, will this go in? Yeah, it'll slide. It right will? In there. Yeah. So if I wanted to just slide that. Oh, see, I overreacted. That's called overreacting, but that's what I do. Well, you were the one helping me put this bumper on. You remember that? Yeah. You said, let's start with the bumper. Yeah, well, I'm not that smart. Everybody knows that. You know, I took a shot in the head when I was a kid, all right? <laughs> I had issues as a kid, all right? I'm doing the best that I can. OK, let's talk about this for a quick second. So this is the quarter extension. This is what finishes off the quarter panel. This is a plastic gasket that goes on between the extension and the quarter panel. These are the factory studs, and you'll see that we put a little bit of that sealing stuff on each one of these studs to keep the water from coming inside the trunk. You can use any nut in the world that'll go on there, but there's one that's correct, and they're called bell nuts. Take a nice little look at that. You see the little teeths, those little teeths in there? Those are for cutting into the paint. You can see it's a machine thread, and so when it goes on, it's gonna be just something like that right there. Put this first one on. This is beautiful. It really finishes it off nicely. So one of the things to point out here, if you are doing one of these cars at home, is you see us put these quarter extensions on and everything lines up really nice. Well, it's not by accident. Those were in place when the body man, the metal guy did his work and the mud guy did his work and the finish guy did his work. They have to be because the odds that you're just gonna take an original shaped quarter extension and make it fit a brand new aftermarket AMB quarter panel, there's gonna be minute differences, little shape differences, the way they fit. So everything that you see in the way of good fitment is intentional because like I say, a lot of guys were involved in making sure it's right before it got into paint. The sound of 70. The groovy Roadrunner continues with two-door hardtop, convertible, and drag favorite, the two-door coupe. New from 1970 is this bright vertical bar grille on Roadrunner, Satellite, and Belvedere. Those bumper guards are standard across the board on all the new Plymouth Belvedere's. The next thing to install are the taillight housings, the bezels, and the lenses. These are 70 satellite Roadrunner Belvedere taillight housings and taillight lenses. The difference is the bezel. If this was just a Belvedere, yeah. this would be open. It wouldn't have this third band across here. It's just a big open pocket. Oh, this wow. is what makes it Roadrunner. Oh, I didn't know that. And GTX. OK. Yep. So this goes through from the back side, so then this. That goes in there, and then in between here is the rear body panel that gets pinched. So that goes in like that. That makes you a complete taillight. Isn't that beautiful? This is a closed bell nut. You see it's all closed in right there. It's the same kind of principle as the others. It'll get this little gasket on there like that, and then it'll get the bell nut on there. OK. All right, I'm going to put that in, and I'll line this up. This is always, always a little tricky. Well, you there got to go. hit, yeah, you got to hit that. For, oh, you got it. Okay, just go ahead perfect, and put the nuts yeah. on. Oh. What? <laughs> you got to really push these in because that gasket's so Jeez, thick. Yeah, it's tough. There you go. All right. Maybe this goes up just a hair, but not much. Okay. There we go. So you're saying it pops out of reverse? Yeah. So. Didn't Doug set the alignment on the neutral gate? So I've been roostered. They were putting taillights in, and then they target me. I don't know how I get drug into this. See, when we were kids, he had the only four-speed car. Mine was an automatic, so he had a lot of experience with four-speeds. Now he oh. tore the hell out of him. Yeah, he should know then, right? Oh, he should know. He should know. He liked to burn them up, though, too, right? He destroyed everything he touched. Hey, now, Dougie ain't no angel. I was there when he did the reverse burnouts and busted his engine mounts, all right? Don't everybody be writing in what a sweetheart. I mean, yeah, he got some baggage, too. We all do. I'm going to get him. And now! <laughs> no, no! Hey, Dougie. 
How are Jens? This ain't gonna end well. I had a question for you. Um, I got a 70 Roadrunner out here. Have you ever seen it? EV2 Tour Red. He's not gonna give us a straight answer either. According to your friend, Justin, he says it won't stay in reverse, that when he goes to put it in reverse, it just pops back out, like it's not engaging all the way. Yeah. You know anything about that? Brain is somewhere out in space. Did you set the neutral gate on that? Probably not. Dreaming about Rocky Road ice cream or something. You ever had a four-speed transmission pop out on you? No. Only second gear. You ever do reverse burnouts? And they never popped out? All right, we got a bunch of letters. I don't know, he's probably doing dreaming about Rocky Road ice cream. No, 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 uh, Chocolate Brownie Thunder by Amqua. Oh, did he change? Oh, he's always loved Chocolate Brownie well, Thunder. Well, he always says Rocky Road. He never Road said every Rocky time Road at time in his life. Every time. He has never used the word Rocky Road. Yeah, well. You know, I really love my job, but sometimes I feel like I'm slipping into Mark and Doug's craziness, defending myself on things I probably don't have to. Dougie, do you like Rocky Road ice cream? Rocky Road? Who, who brought up the Rocky Road? Well, you just been telling him that's all you like. That's all you've been saying. I said, no, no, it's Chocolate Brownie Thunder. Yeah, Chocolate Brownie Thunder. So why would you lie to him? I never lied to him. Where did you dream up Rocky Road at? He says it every day. Every day every you say day. you like Rocky Road ice cream. This is one of the things I get a lot of crap about. I, sh I just walk away. My wife will say that. She goes, why don't you just walk away from the conversation? It's pointless. Anyway, even if you do win, what does, that's not the point. The point is resolution. I cannot leave a conversation unresolved. All right, I'll talk about it forever. I'll take the entire hour. I don't care what happens to our ratings. I'll talk about it till the end of the world. I'll talk about it till the zombies take over. I'll sit down with a zombie like this. I'd sit down with one of those and discuss ice cream. Morgan, come out. Doesn't matter to me, man. I get paid the same. A new Roadrunner option is the dust swirl tape stripe, adding new identification to America's most exciting car. Standard on the engine is a 383 four barrel and 335 horsepower. New performance styled instrument panel for GTX and Roadrunner has the look and efficiency of a supercar. The optional center console with bucket seats is useful as well as beautiful. These are the letters that call out the word Plymouth. Plymouth. These are new replicas of the original letters. They have the black shadow down low, you see that. They have the self-cutter style studs on them, and then they use these little nuts right here that are also similar to the bell nuts. These are a self-cutter. They have a little sealer on it. They're going to go in there like that, and that is going to finish that letter off. And then he's going to put those in one at a time, and they're going to be just beautiful. One of the good things about where we're at right now in the restoration world, as far as evolution, these letters, they were non-existent 10 years ago, five years ago. So now guys like Classic Industry makes brand new ones. They're as good as the original ones, except they haven't been re-chromed. You try to re-chrome a pot metal part, it never comes out very nice. These are brand new, and they fit perfect. All right, first two, H, M, stands for ice tray. <laughs> you know, we ought to maybe have me a couple of little things made like that, like just Ow, you, man. Piece of well, I can't tell if they're straight or not. They're probably crooked as hell. The H needs to go down on the left. The M is maybe a hair up on the right or down on the left, one of the two. That's good. Yeah, there and tighten it. The L is good where it's at, and the P needs to go up on the right. Right there. All right. Yeah, let's loosen this one up a little bit. Okay. What it is is this quarter extension needs to go that way to close this gap up a little bit. See how it's a little bit wide? We need to move this over a little bit. If you look at the other side, you'll see it's a real nice clean gap. So I think if we just move this over, we'll have that gap fixed. Okay. So once you have all the adjustments made on the tail lights, all the lettering is where it's supposed to be, everything is secured, you have all the sealer on all the nuts, close that deck lid, and voila. You've got a beautiful, one year only, 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner.
Let's see how much you've been paying attention. True or false, the luxurious center console is standard on all Roadrunner models. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. We'll see how you did. So, do you think you got this one right? The luxurious center console is standard on all Roadrunner models. If you guessed false, you are right. The center console is available as an option and not standard equipment. The air grabber is standard with a Hemi and optional with a 440. Vacuum operated, the air grabber sends cooler, denser air into the cars. Music lovers can choose from AM FM Solid State Radio, the magnificent stereo tape player with AM radio, or the instant on Solid State AM radio. New bucket seats with integral head restraints provide full support, luxurious comfort, and minimal interference with rearward visibility. Whatever your bag in performance and competition, Roadrunner lives up to its name. Really, anywhere in here, in this area, you can put this decal. Mm -hmm. Let's say I like the looks of it there. The only problem is we still have our yeah. quarter extension pieces. We want to make sure that we can put this right in line with that, have a straight trajectory across there, and still be on our extension like we want it to be. So like right there, on my end, looks just perfect. So we're using an application gel, in this case anybody's wondering. And you gotta make sure that you get the stuff off your hands because if you get this backing paper wet, remember back when Alyssa and Will did all that magic? <laughs> yeah, They I just do. ruined it. <laughs> you know, it's typical Mark fashion. He beats everything to death. Alyssa and I made a mistake, and it was a big one. I mean, don't get me wrong, but he needs to just, he beats stuff until it's just not funny. That's they not just good. ruined it. They ruined it. All I'm saying is I took the time to show them how to do it correctly. That's all I can do, right? If they want to throw my ideas to the wind and say they got their own idea, the old man is wrong, and just do it their way, then fine, do it. Those are the results you get, though. But the one nice thing is we screwed it up so bad, he doesn't even ask me to do it anymore, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. That's a cool reflective backing on it. I too. love it, yeah, let's yeah. show that real quick. Now on the transverse stripe, this is a tape stripe. It's available on the 70 Roadrunner in black and white. It's reflective. This particular car gets it in black. If you go back to season one, which is available on YouTube, Graveyard Cars on YouTube, you can watch that episode, Running Down a Dream. That car got a white one. But again, they're both reflective. Really a neat accent to the back of these cars. Oh, let's see here. There we go. Well, up here, right there. Probably need to work it over this way just a tiny bit. You need to come your way, yeah. Yeah. Let me take a look here. Pretty even. Nice reveal on each side. That's nice. I think so. Once you get the decal set, the next thing you do is just squeegee out the water, and then we can move on to the quarter extension decals. OK, it's been set in about half of an hour. Let me look at this thing down here. Now, when it comes to removing the film, the backing film on these decals, the hardest part is getting that first start because it's usually around an area that isn't locked down yet, like the ends. So getting it peeled and started without pulling the decal back up, that's the hardest part. Once you do and you have a good clear start, it's just a matter of walking it off there very carefully and watching for bubbles as you go. It's such a little decal, there's just hardly anything holding it there. Yeah. Okay. Think we're good? Yeah. Okay. I just like to panic. Believe me, no, nobody likes a panicker, everybody likes a panicker. Because if I'd have been on the Titanic, I guarantee you we'd all be alive today. How's yours doing? Just about there. This decal went on with no troubles, no bubbles. I just love being able to stand back and seeing this black on orange decal. It just screams cool. This is the all-new 1971 Roadrunner, two-door hardtop. The new profile is distinctively unique. The long, sleek, powerful hood with clipped rear deck. The looped bumper on two-door models completely surrounds the handsome grille. New on all two-door and four-door models. Concealed windshield wipers for better visibility. 
and the rear track has been widened to 62 inches on V8s for improved stability and handling. When the 71 Roadrunner came to us, it was missing the original engine transmission and rear end. It had a 383 and an automatic in it. We rounded up a correct G440 HP engine, a correct 71 Hemi four-speed transmission, and then we called our friends at Mosier for a replica of the original Dana rear axle assembly. Doug is over there working on that right now. While he's doing that, and before we install it, I wanted to go over some of the finer points of detail on our engine to show you exactly how accurate it is in 1971. This is really interesting stuff. All right, so our 71 drivetrain, for the most part, is hard to even distinguish between a 70 and a 71. They're that close to being the same thing. So if you're at like a show and somebody's got, say, the wrong valve cover on a 70, you could call them out on it. So our 71 Roadrunner 446 barrel four speed. This is date coded correct, but not original numbers matching. When my dad starts geeking out on something, I used to tune him out. But now I've realized he's probably going to quiz me on something he's already told me. So now I make sure to pay attention. In all honesty, my dad knows a lot, and I'm really happy he takes the time to share with everybody. Being a Plymouth, you see the word 446 barrel across there. So this is one of the areas my dad always gets me, the difference between six pack and six barrel. So six pack is Dodge, and six barrel is Plymouth. See, starting to learn. Underneath that, show you the carburetor setup. So these are the three two-barrel Hollies that you would see in 70. They do have different numbers on them for 71 versus 70. These are the Holly reproduced six-barrel setup or six-pack setup. Okay, so this is the part where I get a little nervous sometimes because putting these drivetrains together, there's so many details. And once in a while, I will miss a thing or two, but it won't get past Mark or Tony. So all the markings need to be put on these still, which we do right before we put it in the car. The bolts, you'll notice though, these are the original Highland bolts that hold them in place. That's correct in both 70 and 71. The idle stop solenoid is the same in 70 and 71. It isn't until you get over to like the valve cover. It actually started showing up mid-year 1971. They changed the valve covers and put this provision in it for a later breather, okay? If you have a 1970, this would not be here. This would be smooth across here. This particular car was built in April of 1971, so it was built after these started showing up, so we felt like that's the right valve cover to put on there. But let's say this was an early build, like in August or September, October, November, it would have the 1970 on it because we don't have any recorded dates of the smooth ones showing up any earlier than that. The exhaust manifolds, they're the same, 70 and 71. You lower yourself down from the manifold to, say, the spark plug wires. This car was built in April, which is the second quarter of 71, and it wants to precede it a little bit. These would be the right wires. So these are correct and reflect the 71 model versus the 1970 model. There's more to an OE restoration than just the right colors and the right bolts. Date codes are super important. You can't have parts that are date coded after the time your car was built. So you have to know when your car was built, and sometimes you have to look at examples of cars built around the same time as yours and see what date codes are being used on those. Power steering pump is the same, hoses are the same. At a glance, most everything else is the same. If you stop and look at the part number, say on the lower radiator hose, that is the correct one for 1971. Even though the one from 1970 probably would fit and work, that's the correct one to have on there. Same thing for this one. That is the correct part number because they did not change it on 1971s. Crank pulley, water pump pulley, power steering pulley, belts would be date coded. Dates right here, you can see that this is actually designed for a 1971 model year car. On this one, we took the liberty, as Tony would say, of putting a electronic ignition style distributor in it because the gentleman that owns the car want to be really durable and dependable. He had no problem with it. He didn't have the original one anyway, so we just put that one in it. The spring is correct for the 71 446 barrel or six pack. The cable, you see that the bracket is supposed to be painted while the actual fastener is the original zinc with the black phosphate nut, all correct. And it should have that little dot of orange on it because this and this were not on there at the time, but the bracket was and the bracket would have all got painted at the same time. Oil pressure sending unit, this is designed and calibrated for the gauge style, which is what this car has. These are replicas of the original negative and positive battery cables. You look at the suspension, 
exactly the same as 1971. The caliper goes in front of the lower ball joint, and this caliper is unique to 70 to 72. It isn't until 73 that they went to the sliding style banjo fitting caliper. Now listen, when we do these cars, we do try our very best to make them correct and accurate. Now I've even learned things since I started the show 10 years ago. You meet guys like Tony who, you know, I give him a lot of crap, but he knows that I love him and I respect him. And he has taught me a lot about the correctness of things that I thought was correct. So now when you see us doing it and you see us analyzing something we've done or sharing it with you at home, it's because in my heart and in my mind, it's as accurate to OEM as can be. All 70 Roadrunners, in case you didn't know this, get a dust trail stripe. The stripe that starts with the bird on the fender, works its way down the fender, down the door, and into the first part of the quarter and ends in that reverse scallop. They are all supposed to have it, but people would opt to delete it. In the particular case of this car, it was stripe delete, so it didn't get it, but the owner wants to add it. So just something there, if you didn't know that, they should all have it unless it's called out that it's stripe delete. And what we've done already is we've laid the tape out to show where it'll go, so you won't need much of my help. I just yeah. wanna make sure that I point out exactly how these things go in space and what direction they go. After that, it's just putting decals on and he can handle it. So, feel good? Oh, we'll see. Feel ready? I've never done this one yet, so. I made the mistake on my very, very first restoration about 25 years ago of not paying attention to what direction things went. So you can clearly see looking at the bird, right? He's taking off running. He's going after the coyote, right? Actually, he's running from the coyote, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure who the victim was in that. <laughs> but you can see that the dust trail leans forward at the top okay. and back at the bottom. That's because his feet are going that direction like yeah. that. Another way they give you a locator is this little X should always appear on the bottom. Okay. Well, there's no way we're going to take this and turn it upside down in the car. We're no. not on tops, yeah. right? It's the next one. So this is the one that's gonna go on the door. So you just wanna make sure that this... Make sure the X's are on the, on bottom, the bottom and that these are leaning forward, forward the on top, the top. Okay. back at the bottom. Then when you intersect them, you put it right there. They line up almost perfect. You'll squeegee along there and just make sure when you, that this one's locked down so it doesn't begin to peel that one. Okay. And since we have the tape already laid out all the way down the side, you know you where You got your level be. set. Main thing is, if you were to take this dust trail stripe and end it lower in the saddle, yeah. it's gonna have to go uphill by the time you get to the front of the car. If you look at some of them, they're uphill. Yeah. This owner does not want that. I think that even from the factory, they did that because these were installed by humans. We just want to try to do better if we can. Here's your Roadrunner emblem in factory original holes. Let's make that dust trail stripe where the bottom of it's almost at the top of the letter. Okay. And that's about what I think you have it laid out as, right? Yeah, about the middle, yeah. Once Mark explained to me how the factory does the decals and how the customer wanted it, it made a lot more sense to me. We didn't want this decal going uphill or downhill, so we made it nice and level with the car. And with that, I can install the graphics. The look of motion, speed, performance. Gained by having two separate roof lines. One for hardtops and one for sedans. Moving closer, two more performance car options, the new louvered backlight, and a spoiler for front and rear. Both options available on GTX and Roadrunner. An option offering a sporty look as well as utility. This new luggage rack available on two-door models, but not with rear deck spoiler, of course. This is the second 70 Roadrunner that I've been able to work on. The first one I worked on, it had the stripe delete on it. It just had the running bird on it. It didn't have the dust trail stripe. This one, I actually got to do the dust trail, which was really cool. So first time doing that, I had Mark help me out, eyeball things for me. But you know, with his help, I've just been able to be really efficient with getting the decals on these cars. Such a cool, unique stripe and design that they did, you know, keeping with the cartoon theme from the Roadrunner. All right, now that this side is all ready, set in place, 
flip over, I can do the other side. And then by the time I'm done with that side, come over here, peel the backing paper off, give it a nice wipe down and see how it turned out. So one of my favorite parts right here is peeling off that backing film and you get to just stand back and see how the decal looks on the car. So as the lead assembly tech here, it's my job to do all the assembly line markings on the cars. We use a lot of reference materials and original pictures of these cars before they were taken apart. You know, whether people have seen these assembly line markings in our show or big shows, I never get tired of it. I, I think it's fascinating. What we do is we emulate all the markings that the assembly line would have put on it to tell the people down the assembly line what's been done. I usually start at the back of the car and work my way forward. A lot of these get a dab of paint on them. And on the assembly line, this is to indicate that that bolt has been tightened and or the fluids have been filled or what have you. Some markings like the three digits on the back of the axle housing were done before the part was installed in the car. And we just duplicate the appearance and that's all. It's important when you're doing this to not go on autopilot and assume something. Every color meant something on the assembly line, so you have to refer to the manuals as you go along. While we don't know what some of these colors meant, we do know based on their location. We believe that blue meant that the fluids have been topped off, like your transmission or your rear axle. We actually take it a bit further now because we did have that 1970 Dodge Coronet that came back to us, Brett Torino's, for, for little detailing things, a loose nut here, a loose bolt there. So we decided at that point, we're gonna put all the assembly line markings on these cars that the factory did, but we're gonna do our own too, graveyard car style. So you will see a lot of white marks. We check every bolt and every fastener on that car and every fluid level, and we mark it with our own internal markings. And when you stand back and look at that, when it's all done, you run down the bottom of it, that car looks brand new. All the assembly line markings, all the stuff that's on it, the shiny new metal and the beautiful painted body and the undercoating, it looks like you've just duplicated 1970. Let's see how much you remember. The rear track was widened on the 1971 Roadrunner. How wide was the rear track? 62 inches, 65 inches, or 67 inches? If you think you have the answer, stay tuned after the break and find out. So how did you do? How wide was the rear track on the 1971 Roadrunner? If you guessed 65 or 67 inches, you might be considered an imbecile. The correct answer is 62 inches. The rear track has been widened on V8s for improved stability and handling. Here's an option with surefire appeal for GTX, Sebring Plus, and Roadrunner customers the new elastomeric bumper in six matching body colors. New recessed door handles on two doors and four doors add to convenience and overall styling beauty. An option that offers the best in open and closed bodies, the new sunroof, available on all two-door hardtops with vinyl roof. One of the last things I do before I hand the keys over to Mark is I do all the information labels and the safety labels. These are super cool and really give it that factory touch. We have the ethylene glycol or antifreeze information label. Now when you're watching Justin put these information labels on the car, it's one thing that they're available. 
So a huge shout out to Dave Walden from ECS. He passed a couple of years ago, I think it's been now. But he was a huge leader in our industry. He researched original cars and duplicated these decals, but not just duplicated them, but where they go. You can put a part number anywhere on a positive battery cable from where it goes on to the starter all the way up to the battery, where the factory put it on at. That is a portion of the contribution that man made to the industry. So today, we grab our ECS catalog, we look exactly what the part number is, where it goes on there, and we can duplicate the way the assembly line had it when it left the day it was built. The door VIN decal is very important to the validation of these cars. Unfortunately, we can't mask off the VIN labels on the doors. Through the dipping process, they're just going to get destroyed anyways. Mark takes pictures of the original decals on these cars, sends that to ECS so they can send us the proper ones to put on these cars. What I'm looking for on this final inspection is just to make sure that every nut and bolt has a marking on it. I know I don't have to check it myself. I don't have to go under there and torque it. It's got the marking on it. It's already been checked. I'm banging on mufflers to make sure they don't hit the exhaust. Looking for those inspection markings. Double checking to make sure that everything underneath the car is ready and roadworthy. I do the same thing on the outside of the car. Make sure we don't have any leaks. That's another thing I like to look for. Something that leaks now a little bit, will leak a lot later. I've already made sure all the headlights work, side markers, turn signals, that the grill fits, that the doors fit, everything fits the way it should. But because the car has been in the shop for a while, things happen. A new ding, a new scratch. Maybe one of your new parts quit working. This is your last chance, this is your last firewall to go around that car before it goes home to the owner. And the owner's waiting there with a great big halogen flashlight, because he's going to go up your ass with that flashlight, and he's going to look for every conceivable possible detail on that car, and you're going to be the first one he calls. Look at the line, see if anything's changed, the hood to door gap, the same, did the moldings get scratched putting them on, dash VIN secured in place and doesn't look weird, mirrors, give them a little wiggle, door handles, make sure they're tight. Now, when I'm talking about these guys crawling up your ass with a flashlight, I mean that when it gets home, all the things that you take for granted and you don't pay attention to, they do. Because my job is to make sure that car's safe and sound and ready to go home. But do you pull the pleats apart where the beading on the seat meets the inlay and look for dirt and look for dust in there? No, I don't, all right? But we do now. Same thing at the back, you're just making sure. Give a little tap on the exhaust, make sure it's not rattling against the bottom of the car. Letters are straight still, decals straight, alignment's good. So everything's pretty much exactly the way the last time I looked at it, it was. With that, I do a quick system check. This is all before we take it out and drive it. Turn it on, check the right turn signal, left turn signal. Okay, we're ready to go for a drive. This thing goes for a drive, I call the owner, tell him to come get it. That's how we do it at Graveyard Cars, just like that. So, good job. <laughs>